Now we're gonna do chapter six of Clementine and the family meeting. And remember how she lost her hat. We'll see, there's my hat. I'm wearing my hat in honor of Clementine. Chapter six, on the bus Wednesday morning, Margaret said I looked even worse. There's Margaret and Clementine. I looked even worse, completely washed out. Even your teeth have faded. I guess this means you couldn't talk them out of it. Sometimes Margaret was N-O-T, not helpful. You can't talk someone out of having a baby, Margaret, I said. They've already started. It's already kicking my mom and stuff. Well, then what are they going to name it? A fruit like you or a vegetable like your brother? I looked at Margaret. That was a really good question. My brother has a regular name, I reminded her. I just call him vegetable names to make things fair. Still, I think the baby should have a food name. Maybe a soup name, Margaret said, or a sandwich, or a dessert. Those are good ideas, Margaret, I said. Then I rolled up my sleeve and wrote them down on my arm so I wouldn't forget. Not dessert, though. I liked dessert. I know, we should name the baby Mushroom Soup. You hate mushroom soup the worst, Margaret said. Exactly right. In school, at morning circle time, Mr. DeMatt said, I would like to start by sharing something about myself. All the kids whipped to attention, surprised. Except me. I gave him a tiny, secret smile. I'm going to be a father soon, he said. My wife and I are expecting a baby. Everyone went crazy then, talking at once and making noises like this was the most exciting thing that had ever happened in the history of the world. Finally, Mr. DeMatz held up his hand to calm things down. I'm wondering how many of you have had new babies come into your families. About half the kids' hands shot up. I raised my hand too, but I looked at Mr. DeMatz hard to remind him about our privacy agreement. He gave me the slightest nod. Would anyone like to share what it was like to have a new brother or sister, he asked the class. One after the other, kids raised their hands and talked about how great it was to have a new baby come into the family, how cute the babies were, how much fun. I said my times tables really loud in my head. Is there anyone else here who would like to share something? Mr. DeMatz looked around the circle. His eyes stopped at me for just a second, and he raised his eyebrows. Nope, I said, nobody has anything else to share. The rest of the day didn't get any better. I went to the lost and found, and there were 11 winter hats. None of them was mine. On the way back, I stopped Mr. Riley, the custodian, and asked him to keep an eye out for 18. But he said a sixth grader had knocked a water fountain off the wall and it would be a miracle if he could keep the whole second floor from flooding. And at lunch, Waylon told me his new plan of using his x-ray vision as a science project. But when he tried to guess what was in my lunch bag, he couldn't even see the juice box poking out of the top. Back in the classroom, I started worrying about 18 again. Danger was everywhere. What if he crawled into a pencil sharpener? I scratched up my elbows. What if he got trapped in a locker? I scraped up my itchy shoulders up and down the back of my chair. What if he wandered into the boys' room and got flushed down the drain? My scratchy skin wanted to peel itself off my bones. Finally, I excused myself and left to see Principal Rice. Okay, fine. I didn't actually excuse myself and leave. My teacher sent me. But I would have excused myself and left if I had to sit still in my worried skin for one second more. It's been a while, Clementine, Mrs. Rice said. What are we here for today? I'm worried about 18, I said, handing her the note from Mr. DeMatz. It's making me itchy. That's odd, Mrs. Rice said, reading the note. According to this, we're here to talk about your not distracting the other students. You probably just read the note too fast, I said. I added an understanding smile because I read things too fast sometimes also. It probably says that other students were distracting me from worrying about 18. Mrs. Rice read the note again, shook her head, then put it down. 
Well, anyway, she said, you're worried about a number? Oh, no, 18's his name, our rat. Waylon and I... Oh, right, Mrs. Rice interrupted me. The one who made the breakout from the science room over the weekend. That's him, I said. This is a really dangerous place if you're a rat. We have to shut down the school and search. Wait, you already knew about 18? Mrs. Rice nodded. Mrs. Resnick told me yesterday. I sent a, mo a memo to the custodians and the lunchroom staff. You already did? Well, good, I said, but somehow I didn't feel good. Finally, it hit me. You mean the custodians knew, even Mr. Riley? Mrs. Rice nodded again, so everyone's on the lookout. I hope that's going to cut down on this the distractions in your classroom, whoever is distracting whom. I sat there thinking about all the things that grown-ups knew and hadn't told kids and trying to think of a single thing that kids knew and hadn't told grown-ups. There she is with Mrs. Rice, the principal. Finally, I came up with one. My teacher is getting a baby. He told us today. Yes, I know. It's exciting news, isn't it? You knew that too? I knew that too, Mrs. Rice said. Can I be all done being here? I asked. That depends, Mrs. Rice said. Are you still feeling itchy? I said no, which was true because now I was feeling too mad to be itchy. And I went back to my classroom. I was still mad when I got home from school. I announced my bad mood when I opened the door. It's just me, sport, my dad called, coming into the hall. Your mom's at the library with your brother. What's the problem? Everything, I growled. My dad pulled his apartment manager keys out of his pocket. Do you need to take a few rides? Usually, when I'm upset, riding the service elevator calms me down. Not today. I shook my head. What I need is to find my last year's winter hat. I opened the hall closet and dragged out everything that was in the way of the stroller. I climbed up on it to take a look around. Careful there, my dad said, we're going to need that. No, we don't, I said. String bean walks great now. He's still a little guy, my dad pointed out. His legs still get tired. I climbed down. What about my tired legs, I asked. I have tired legs all the time. How come nobody cares about them? If I have to walk, he should have to walk. My dad just looked at me, which made me know I was being too crabby. Still. Besides, pretty soon we'll need it for the new baby. Hey, is this the hat you're looking for? He handed me my last year's hat. It had only three colors. There were no yarn tails sticking out. It looked tight and itchy, and I threw it into the back of the closet. Want to tell me what else is wrong? My dad asked. And suddenly I did have tired eggs, legs, tired legs. I slumped down to the floor in the middle of the closet mess. My dad sat down beside me. He tucked his keys back into his pocket and a pack of gum fell out. Huh, he said. Wonder how that got in there. He unwrapped two sticks and gave me one. There they are, chewing their sticks of gum in the closet mess. We sat there for a few minutes, chomping hard. Everything's changing, I said after a while. Cabbage is tall now. He's having a talking spurt. Margaret is a makeup fiend, and she's trying to move to California. We're going to be five, and not four anymore, but we're out of rooms, and I'm stuck with Waylon for a partner in science. You're right, my dad said. Things are changing. We can't help that. It's life. But I'm confused about Waylon. Didn't you tell me last week you felt lucky that you'd gotten him for a partner? That was last week, before I found out. Before you found out what? That he wants to walk through a wall. Excuse me? Exactly, I said. I chewed my gum for a while, then I explained the whole situation to him. And you don't believe in superpowers, my dad said when I finished. I looked at him. Well, I don't know about that, but I don't believe Waylon has any. That's a tough one, said my dad. You don't think there's a science project there, but you don't want to hurt his feelings. I wish I could think of something to help. She's talking to her dad. I leaned up against my dad and we chewed our gum for a while until I realized I felt better. That is the miracle about gum. 
Hey, Dad, I said, side smiling at him. You know what might help? If I could wear your tool belt. My dad side smiled back. Side smile. Oh, too bad. It's in the vault. I have to keep it locked up because it's so special. That tool belt was given to me by the President of the United States in appreciation for my lifelong service to this country. Dad. Seriously, it was in the Oval Office. I wore a tux. Dad. It was in Hardware Depot, aisle 7. You wore your raggedy green pants. Oh, right, my dad said. I can't believe your mother let me wear those pants out of the house. So where is it really? Really? Well, really, your Uncle Frank was here this morning. He's putting up some shelves in his kitchen, and I let him borrow it. I jumped up and spit my gum out onto the back of my hand. Dad, you let Uncle Frank borrow it? But you never even let me touch it. My dad got up too. Clementine, what is the deal with my tool belt? Tool belt. I've never seen you so obsessed. It's just, it's just, I said, trying to figure it out myself. It looks so cool and it's got all your tools and if I wore it, I could build something anytime I wanted. And you want to build something? Yes, of course. My dad looked at me like he was seeing a new person. I didn't know that about you, he said at last. Well, I didn't know it either, I admitted, until I saw the tool belt. And that's the end of chapter six.